You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Join us now for the expert source for inside information on the options markets. It's time for Options Insider Radio with your host, Mark Longo. Welcome back to Options Insider Radio, the interview program here on the old network where we welcome on guests from throughout the world of options and derivatives and proceed to pick their brains for the benefit of you, the listener. My name is Mark Longo from the optionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever exciting, at least we hope so, Options Insider Radio Network. If I sound a wee bit different, because we're not coming at you from our studio in Chicago. No, we're down here in the Options Industry Conference in scenic Except for today, scenic and sunny Miami, Florida, where we're breaking down all the latest developments in the world of options with a slew of great guests, including our next guest. He's been on before, but it's been a while. He is Ed Zizato, the Associate Professor of Finance at the Providence College School of Business. Ed, welcome back to the Options Insider Radio Program. Thanks, Mark. It's great to be here. It's, it's been a few years since you've, uh, you've been on the program to break down one of your studies. So do a, really quick for our audience, give them a little bit of an overview, a little bit of a refresher of, uh, of your background, you kind of your focus in the academic world and, and how you found yourself focusing on such a very specific area of research. So I, I tend to focus mostly on volatility strategies and option-based investment strategies. Um, and that's where my, my background was in both in uh, getting my PhD and also since then most of my research focuses on that. How did you get lured to the dark side of volatility research, sir, if I may ask? I suppose it started with a, a paper that was commissioned by the Option Industry Council. Oh, so they lured you to the dark side. Yeah. Ah, yeah. I see. <laughs> um, way back when I did a paper on buy rate strategies. Yes. Yes, I am familiar with that one. Well, you're here, to, of course, to discuss a new paper entitled Endowment Risk Management and Return Enhancement with Listed Index and ETF Options. Did I get it all in there, Ed? Did I, did I fit it all in? Well it's, it, yep. it's, it's a very full title. It, gets, it encapsulates the, the broad strokes of the, the paper. But, of course, there's a lot of interesting findings in here. Why don't you break down the impetus behind the study, why you decided to look at this, and maybe some of the interesting, uh, interesting takeaways that you, you found along the way. Sure. Well, there, there are three main things that we try to tackle with the study. There's comparing the performance of, of cash-settled index options versus physically settled ETF options um, with the same uh, basic underlying, um, looking at, at put-spread callers in addition to, to the, the buy rates, which have, have been well studied. And the third big, big and probably most important contribution is looking at the strategy performance in an endowment uh, endowment environment. So we're looking at it in very well diversified portfolios as opposed to on a standalone basis. And, and the results we find are, are encouraging and, and are kind of what we expect. The buy right strategies enhance returns both standalone and even in the, the well diversified portfolios. Um, and the put spread callers in, it, it enhance returns a, bit, a little bit less but they, they provide significant uh, reductions in, in risk, um, particularly in maximum drawdowns. Interesting. So what, what were some of the surprises you encountered by doing that? Was it, was it the performance in the endowments, really, or what, what surprised you the most in this paper? Yes, in the endowments, because you would think that these, these – so I looked at small endowments, medium-sized endowments, and, and very large endowments based on, on kind of policy weight uh, returns – and it was it was surprising to see that the the risk reductions were really meaningful 
in a portfolio that is already very well diversified um, across a, a wide variety of asset classes. And now you talked about comparing buy rights versus put spread collars. Our audience likes to get into the weeds a little bit. So walk us through how you constructed uh, these put spread collars. Were there, was there multiple months in between? Or what was the setup? What was the construction for this? So the, the buy rights were straight up one month, uh, 2% or 5% out of money calls. The put spread collars used the one month calls with a, a six month uh, bear pull, put spread. So trying to take advantage of that more rapid decay on the call side um, from that shorter, shorter. As I call that lines up with some of your earlier studies and the, some of the studies that OIC has done where they, they found that optimal period to be, right? The, about, about six months for that put in terms of exactly. paying too much versus decaying too much, correct? And, correct. Uh, so interesting. So that's, that was the structure for the put spread collar. And then the collar, the, sorry, the covered call was just the, the straight up one month. Have you, have you explored or have any thoughts about looking into the weeklies as a way to augment the buy rights? Is that something that's on your radar? I, I haven't. I, I looked briefly at that a while back, and, and I think that there's, there's even more opportunity there than the, the monthlies. But um, because you, you have that sequential writing, again, that very quick time decay. So I think, that, I think that you can enhance things by looking at, at weekly calls. Of course, for your primary audience, which is the institutions, yeah, there's probably a bit of a trade-off there between four times a month versus one. One of the biggest complaints we hear from all of that side of the audience is, you know, they just don't have the time, right? They don't have the time to babysit and do these. So if you approach them with something that says, hey, I'm going to get you 0.75% more a year, but you have, to, you have to do this a lot more throughout the month, they, they may push back on that a little bit. Right, plus transaction costs p play a part of it also. If you're writing four times as often, then you're incurring that, that extra spread. Yes, that definitely is, uh, is the case here. I wish it's, 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 your findings here are kind of interesting to me because I know we had some guests on, including uh, Henry yesterday, Henry Schwartz, who does a lot of the, the data for the conference, and he was talking about how there's been interesting growth in uh, there's an overall downtrend in broad equity and ETF volume this year from an options perspective, but in a surprising uptick in single name, uh, which maybe maybe shows that maybe the, the trend towards passive is perhaps that wave is cresting a little bit. Maybe people are starting to do a little bit of stock, stock selection, and it sounds like from your findings here that uh, maybe you're going to further enhance that a little bit, give people a little bit impetus to maybe get a little bit a little bit more active again, Ed. Yeah, absolutely, and and I you know a lot of these strategies can be applied at the individual individual stock level as well. Um, you know, particularly buy rights are, are pretty easy to apply to individual equity. Now, in your impression, when you're when you're presenting these studies and you're talking to endowments and other institutions in general, are you hearing people anecdotally that they seem to be more receptive to these types of studies and this types of data versus five or ten years ago when it was still, I think, a bit of an uphill battle. Are you are hearing a lot more interest in this now? Absolutely. When I first started doing option-based research, it, it was really pretty new to most people. But the 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 interest and, and the, the awareness of, of the performance of the strategies has, has grown leaps and bounds, particularly in recent years. So obviously you have this uh, this current... Uh, research you've done. We just talked about the weeklies. Maybe, maybe I've given you a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a next thing to do, but what are some other areas you think that are interesting, fertile areas for research right now in the, in the options and derivatives market, particularly as it pertains to institutions? I mean, there's a lot of data. These people, they're, they're voracious consumers of data, so the more you can provide them with, the better. Yeah, I've, I've also been looking at, at options and futures on VIX and and a, a lot of these option strategies across a wide range of asset classes because we now have so many ETFs available with options on them. You know, we can, we can do callers or, or put spread callers or buy rights on commodities, on currencies, on, on just a wide, wide range of asset classes. So you know, we got, oh, I'm sorry. We got so excited by the options component, I didn't even give you a chance to relay your studies on the physical versus, versus cash settled uh, component. Walk us through that a little bit. And were there any surprising takeaways there? Well, the the surprise I, I suppose not so surprising, but the performance was was very consistent between the two. So um, that that to me was was uh, kind of the result I, I expected, and um, the result in a sense that that in, in my mind I, I hoped for because um, it allows if if there is no obvious performance differential, then it allows a, an investor to make that choice based on their particular needs, either American settlement versus European, or cash versus physical, or tracking error, or, or the exchange, or whatever it may be. But it, it allows that performance aspect of it to be to be removed from the equation. So one less element for you know a busy institutional client to have to worry about when they're trying to plan their strategy. Do I need to use this versus versus this? They can take that out of the equation and, and focus. 
purely on the efficacy. Exactly. Well, you know, I've always been a big fan of the collar studies that OIC did uh, many years ago. They, they keep updating them, and this is yet another iteration on that. So I'm very, I'm very happy to see that because we, we speak a lot, not just to uh, retail and not just to institutional, but also to a growing audience of, of advisors and asset managers out there. And I've always said many times that the collar particularly the way you kind of constructed here, I think is a very much a, 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 a holy grail type position for a lot of that audience, you know, because it speaks to a lot of their needs. They all have, most of them have long equity exposure and they want to hedge it, so that's a, but they don't want to pay for it. <laughs> so uh, the collar and maybe the collar with an additional put spread kicker on it, things like that are, are great, interesting ways that they can explore to, to find ways to get that protection without maybe, not paying through the nose for it at yeah, that's that's the real appeal of the put spread collar. You, you don't have a floor like you do with a with a collar, but you're net premium collecting, so so it's not putting such a drag on on your portfolio. Yeah, I've often joked, and I've had just used it again a, a couple hours ago in one of our shows here that a large portion of this industry is devoted to paying for puts. <laughs> they spend their entire day trying to figure out how can I get this protection and not really pay an arm and a leg for it. So if you, if you can help them in some capacity, Ed then I think you've done a service to, to all of them. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Uh, well, interesting stuff here. I know there's a lot, of, there's a lot to take away. I, I encourage our listeners uh, to check it out for themselves. I'll give you the full title again so you can search for it. We'll also include a link in our show notes here. It's Endowment Risk Management and Return Enhancement with Listed Index and ETF Options. Say that five times fast, Ed, I dare you. That's, a, that's quite that's a mouthful. <laughs> is that available on the, on the OCC website, OIC website? Yes, it is. Okay, perfect. So they can check it out there. We'll also include a link in our show notes. Before we wrap up here, any, Ed, kind of any other, you kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, any other things you're working on? Maybe you can give us a little bit of a hint, a little bit of a tease of what we can expect for you in the coming months. I've, I've been looking at a, at a lot of things, both in the options area and the ESG area, looking at, at the impact at, at, at an individual equity uh, level of, of kind of socially responsible uh, issues and, and the way it impacts or way it's reflected in implied volatility. So that's something I'm looking at going forward. I can honestly say no one has approached me in that area of research before. So you're definitely you're definitely uh, on maybe the right track there because uh, it's not it's not just how can we harvest the risk premium yet again, right? It's something a little bit different, a little bit more nuanced, and we like to hear that. Well, Ed, we like to hear. Certainly, we love data. I look forward to really spending some time going through uh, you know all the different areas and breaking them down and discussing this maybe further with some of my uh, cohorts there on our advisors option program and and seeing how this plays out uh, in the broad marketplace. So always. More more data, the better, Ed, as far as we're concerned. So thanks for coming on, and we'll look forward to seeing how this study and some additional studies you have, including that one you just mentioned, sounds kind of interesting, how they play out in the marketplace in the coming months. Great. Thanks for having me, Mark. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.